So the topic today is military dissent, GI resistance, you know, veteran dissidents. There's, there's all kinds of words for it. And it's, uh, it's kind of the unspoken, inconvenient topic at hand. Uh, it's always inconvenient. The powers that be, uh, what George Carlin called, I think correctly, the owners of this country, uh, they don't want to even recognize a hint of military dissent. You're, you're not going to hear it from the Pentagon. Uh, the Oval Office, no matter who's in charge, especially this guy, is not going to mention that there's a civil military crisis brewing, uh, one that we haven't seen in, in, in quite a long time. I think predictions are difficult, and none of us really knows how this is going to end. Uh, Petraeus, General Petraeus, uh, said that about the Iraq War. And uh, it was really the only smart thing he said about the Iraq War. Uh, but he was right about that. I don't think any of us know how this is going to end. But uh, I'm going to argue that what's happening today is remarkable, uh, that there is a rising tide of military and veteran dissent, and that it is more profound than anything we've seen in 50 years since the other gentlemen I'm sharing time with uh, were serving and that it is in line with and of a piece with a broader history of American military descent, and, and that's important. And finally, I'll describe some of the strands as, as I see them uh, without making too many predictions. But I will say that there is, if not reason for optimism, uh, there's definitely reason for hope. And a lot of us were sort of waiting for this moment and what it was gonna be or if it was even possible. So, you know, I am a, a very small part of this movement. I'm not a leader. Um, the extent that this is even a movement, right, it, it, in any sort of tangible sense is questionable. Uh, the, the weakness and the strength at the same time of what's happening today in the anti-war community, but also in the broader systemic, you know, social justice critique, the, the weakness is that it's somewhat disorganized. And the strength of it is that it's kind of organic and somewhat disorganized and touches a lot of different topics. So it's good and bad, like so many things. Uh, but I try really hard, especially when it's, you know, in the street stuff for Black Lives Matter or any of these, you know, broader social and criminal justice and racial justice issues to say, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not a leader because uh, look at me, right? And, and, and also I'm not really qualified, uh, but I'm glad to be here in solidarity with those movements. However, I will say, um, you know, I literally just came off uh, the barricade here uh, in what we're calling, you know, Occupied Free Lawrence, uh, Lawrence, Kansas, which is a, a city, a small college town in Kansas with a great history of dissent, right? Starting with the abolitionists who found the joint uh, up to, you know, post Kent State, three day lockdown, National Guard in the streets and all that. And, and for a long time, there was kind of a, you know, a kind of a, a a fallout or a fall off, especially with the college students. But I think we're starting to see some of it again. So, you know, I've been in the streets just about every day, writing, sleeping and eating, not so much. But one of the things that's interesting is I think I used to be naive enough to believe that my status as, of course, a white male full of privilege, but as a veteran would protect me uh, from, from any side, right? Everyone's going to thank me. The police are going to love me and all, and all this, right? And that has not panned out and I should have seen it coming. As a historian, I should have definitely seen it coming, but you know, it's hard to get past some of those delusions. I did not think that I would be in Kansas City three and a half weeks ago and that my own government would tear gas me again. Uh, again, because I thought the last time I would suck down tear gas would be uh, in, in the gas chamber in cadet basic training in July of 2001 uh, up at the academy, but it wasn't, right? And, uh, and since then, it's, it's kind of deteriorated across the board. Um, and what I'm sort of seeing is that active troops, guardsmen, you know, on duty, an enormous number of veterans, and even, I'll give them a little bit, even some of the retired generals are sort of speaking out against at least this usage of the military in the streets with sort of one voice in a way that I've never seen. Uh, whether that lasts is questionable. But for the longest time, the say the, the far right or the militarist hawkish right or, or neoliberal uh, hawks, they could always count on having the veteran and the military community in their pocket, right? And, and th this critique is thrown at the Democratic Party a lot with regards to say the African-American community, the idea being they don't have to fight for the vote so they can be neoliberals and all this and there's some truth in it. But that kind of was true for veterans too. Uh, 
right? And some of it was in mythology that we were all conservative, uh, but disturbingly, there was truth in it. That's kind of coming apart, which is pretty remarkable. And I will argue that something is afoot. Uh, again, I'm a small part of a small part of a big movement. Um, I've written about it recently, but I was in Tulsa uh, for the Trump rally for three days, uh, planning and executing a, I wouldn't say failed, but uh, halting direct action. And I was there, and I, and I think this is like an instructive vignette in a sense. You know, I'm there with 12 members of About Face and Veterans for Peace. I belong to both. Uh, we even had the executive director of Veterans for Peace there, who was, it was a pretty good showing. Uh, invited down there by the local uh, Unified Tulsa community, working in conjunction with, I mean, Greenpeace, and I can't even name all the different organizations to kind of throw this together. And sort of the solidarity and the intersectionality of this was, was incredible. And we were sort of a vanguard, if you'll forgive the Leninist term, of a broader movement that was kind of supporting us. And a lot of this uh, soldiers refusing duty, uh, people signing letters against Trump's actions. I mean, there was just, oh, and then the 89 defense officials and many of whom were four-star generals who were coming out. So this is the backdrop, this is the context. Uh, we seized the flagpoles at the box Center and uh, kind of tried to defend them and sent climbers, two of whom were uh, women, one indigenous from Oklahoma. And uh, the police obviously came down pretty hard and violently and aggressively and, uh, and chucked us. And uh, I think as soon as we took off our Trump disguises, which we painfully wore, uh, and they saw the climbers, then we were, we were in trouble. Uh, but it was, you know, it was, a, it was a great action to be a part of because of the level of support that was behind it, because it was something, it was a small part of a bigger thing. On the way out, as we were escorted, four folks were arrested, including a Vietnam combat medic uh, from the Americal Division up north uh, in Vietnam. He was arrested for taking photos, of course. He was standing in the wrong place because they criminalized space very quickly and very arbitrarily. And then three of our climbers, the rest of us thought we were going into the paddy wagon, you know, but they just tossed us. And on the way out, we had to pass the, the MAGA crowd. Uh, and everyone was wearing this shirt. And uh, almost all of us, except for the ones who had it thrown off in the scuffle when they were thrown on the ground by the police, was wearing these veterans hats. And uh, being escorted out by the police, uh, you would think, naively, that perhaps we'll be treated okay by the crowd. And the, the opposite was the fact. We were screamed Antifa at us. And of course, uh, there were, you know, one person came up into a Marine, like two or three time combat vet friend of mine's face and was, you know, speaking in tongues, like yelling, I assume accusatorily, I don't speak tongues fluently any longer um, or never did, but it was, so it was pretty wild. I think that why this is happening, why events like that are going off, why uh, a significant segment of veterans is actually breaking the mythology, proving we're not a monolith, is there was a whole lot of kindling, okay, for a fire in the United States. And some of us were wondering when it was ever going to kick off. But then when you added the COVID crisis, the depression, that economic one that came from that, uh, the tribalism of the Trump era, I mean, the tribalism has been there since Nixon and it's gotten only worse, but oh my God, like the, it's good and it's bad, right? There's this just division. So when George Floyd, you know, is, is, is urban lynched, right? For eight minutes and 46 seconds, I believe to his death, this, this was just too much. There were rumblings before that of military dissent. Uh, the polls, you know, if, to the extent that you believe them, but when they come from the Kochs and when they come from even a lot of other like right wing sort of organizations, then you, you want to believe them in a sense. When they say that two thirds, this is 2019, two thirds of veterans of the Iraq and Afghan war said those wars weren't worth fighting in the first place. That's remarkable. Uh, I can't actually find precedent for it. I, I, I've been working on data from the Vietnam era, but you know, even at the end of the war, that's probably pretty close to where they were at among the troops, among the veterans, if that. And then uh, this year, early this year, we had 2020 poll that said 73% uh, of veterans of the Afghan war uh, believe we should immediately withdraw from the war in Afghanistan. Now, by the way, both of those poll numbers, right, and there were several polls to this effect, are higher than the civilians, okay, at a higher rate. That's uh, un unheard of, really, uh, with a few exceptions in American history. Captain Crozier with COVID, that's the aircraft carrier that had a little bit of an outbreak of the 
coronavirus, and then he's fired, and it's this whole mess, and Trump basically questions his manhood and patriotism as he's wont to do, uh, and the way that the troops sort of rallied behind that. Of course, not everyone did, and what we saw was a civil war breakout within the veteran community, um, part of which I, I tend to be a polarizing figure and sort of collect some hate mail, as well as, you know, nice stuff. So this was the early rumblings. Uh, what we know now is that the powers that be, as I mentioned, are terrified of this. I mean, they're terrified of this. You know, we always say out in the streets, don't we? You know, we're many, they're few, whose streets, our streets, all this. And then like strictly it's true, but then the problem is they've always been able to count on those foot soldiers and they run from the security guard outside the nice boutique up to the Delta Force, right? Uh, but what happens, and it, it does occasionally happen in empires, uh, what happens when the foot soldiers renege? Uh, this, is, this is scary. So, you know, there is a history to this, though. And, and there's this phrase that gets thrown around a lot now, um, and I'm sure we would throw it around for any, or, you know, for any group. They say, uh, okay, boomer, and all this. And there's like a dismissal of our parents' generation or, my, you know, my people my age. There's a dismissal of our grandparents as like hopeless racist. And there's some truth in, in all of that. But there is a lot to learn from the past. Maybe they're not direct lessons, but military descent has always been part of the American experience. Uh, much of it written out of the history books, like that Vietnam part that I'm going to get to. And I'm going to leave most of it for the actual Vietnam veterans. But, you know, that's been whitewashed. You know, why did the war end? Oh, yeah, the war ended because of all the college kids in the streets. Or, oh, the war ended because Nixon decided to end it. Uh, okay, all of that is somewhat true, but what's forgotten is that the military nearly collapsed. Nearly collapsed in upon itself, uh, especially in some of the draftee forces and especially in the early 70s. Uh, we don't talk a lot about that history. Uh, so where do we fit in? Well, in the Mexican War, that was the highest rate of desertion in Amer any American war, uh, the second being Vietnam. Uh, enormous number, more than 10%, I think it's 13%, uh, just walk off during the Mexican War. Uh, famous generals and presidents like Ulysses S. Grant uh, said that I had a horror of the Mexican-American War, it was the most wicked war ever, and I, I'm ashamed of myself essentially because I didn't have the courage to resign. Right? And he remembered that and talked about it throughout his life, especially later in his life. And, uh, but that, but, you know, he didn't do much at the time, you know, he was a West Point grad and he was a good, you know, good soldier like all of us often are, but he definitely had regrets. Beyond the desertion, we had Irish Catholics run away to the Mexican army and, and fight for them. Uh, and they formed the St. Patrick's or the San Patricio Battalion and they fight, you know, to the death because they know they're going to be executed if they're captured and many are. Uh, you move forward to like the banana wars and the early sort of overseas imperialism. And I heard, I heard the Smedley Butler chapter, right. Uh, mentioned in the bio Smedley Butler is like my hero, right. Uh, it, it, he leaves a 30 something year career in the Marine Corps kind of builds the Marine Corps as we know it today, uh, fights all these imperial wars. And then, he retires and he's starting to have rumblings at the end of his career against that. He retires and he says, I was a gangster for capitalism, that what I did around the world was racketeering. And you want to dismiss him, except he's a two-star general. And back then, that was basically the highest rank in the Marine Corps. And he won the Medal of Honor twice. He would have won it more, except that the write-ups that he, that he got that would have gotten him the Medal of Honor were at a time when officers couldn't win it. So the guy may have earned three or four Medals of Honor, wounded, all this speaks out, you know, maybe puts down like a, a fascist plot that he's offered to lead to overthrow Roosevelt. And, uh, and he's kind of forgotten. I never learned about him in high school. Never. I don't, I certainly didn't learn about it at West Point. So I, I mean, I self-taught, right? Uh, my students at West Point learned about Smedley Butler, but I don't know about everybody else. World War I was an enormous backlash of, dra of draftees, especially. Um, Wilson had called for like a million volunteers. He got 75,000. And then he was like, oh man, I guess I'm going to have to go to a draft, which just deflates the narrative, of course, that everyone was so patriotic about these, you know, submarine attacks and this German aggression. Actually, hundreds of thousands of folks end up in what they called conscientious objector prisons, basically. Uh, they were like labor camps for folks who wouldn't fight. Uh, again, unbelievable amounts. And then there's Vietnam, which I'm only going to briefly touch on, but it's the last draft the army. 
And by the late war, we're starting to see sort of like platoon level mutinies or at least passive resistance um, in the more overt ways. Most people didn't do this. We have the fragging incidents, hundreds, several hundred incidents of fragging with, I believe, 89 deaths of like aggressive officers and NCOs who they felt would have put them in danger to die needlessly in a hopeless war that it was clear, like our wars today, was never even meant to be won, that this was going to be a declare victory and, and then leave. Uh, this all terrified. You know, and then there were salons and underground GI newspapers, racial strife, drug use. Now, some of that's been overplayed, but, it, you know, there was real resistance. So there's a reaction to that. There's a reaction. And the reaction is uh, a Nixonian classic, as always, grade A cynical reaction. And we get the all volunteer force that I spent my life in carrying water for the empire. And there are enormous challenges to the GI descent we're seeing today as a result of that all-volunteer force, right? If you're a volunteer, and I can speak to this personally, if you're a volunteer and you decide to speak out against the wars you're in or you're, you just left, you will be told by folks, well, you volunteered, so why are you complaining? But it's far more than that. It's the sorts of folks that are going to go into it. Uh, the demographics have changed. The military became more Southern, more rural. It became sort of an economic draft. The combat units became more white and male than they were in Vietnam when it was, you know, at certain points there was disproportionate black casualties because, you know, the sorts of folks that wanted to choose combat duties were, were you know, tended to be white Southerners and guys from the Mountain West and then a lot of uh, minorities who were still an enormous portion of the military were in the support branches because it's like they wanted to sort of, uh, you, know, get, you know, get something out of military service. Uh, it's hard to have a, a broad anti-war movement when people graduating high school, people graduating college, and I think more importantly, the mothers of America, right, to use a platitude, don't have to worry that their son who graduates from high school in three months is going to be eligible for the draft. There is not a lot of motivation for her to read the foreign policy section of the New York Times or whatever online source. So there was this real just pushback at any sort of anti-war movement in the civilian world, but then also to a certain extent in the veteran community. So it is even more remarkable that we're seeing what we're seeing today. And I'll briefly kind of close with these strands of dissent that I'm seeing. And then I think it would be more interesting if folks wanna ask later, I can go into depth. The first strand is the one that gets all the attention and it's also the least important and the one that I'm most cautious about. In fact, it's the one that gets, the only one that gets attention and that's the Mattises, St. Mattis, remember him? Uh, the Mattises and, and the uh, Mullins, and then the always late coming Colin Powell's of the world and, you know, about a hundred other senior defense officials, generals and admirals mostly, but some civilians who, well, they said Trump's reaction to the protest with regard to using the troops in the streets was inappropriate. Now, if anyone else had written those letters, pretty much I agree with them word for word, uh, but we must consider the source. None of these folks, mind you, it is remarkable that they did this. I mean, it is still important. It's rare that there's that kind of consensus among pretty conservative folks. I mean, at least systemically. Never had a single one of these generals questioned the systemic imperialism and militarism of the military and the country that they fought for for 30 years. Never one of them, not once publicly, ever. They've never really shown any ability to even look at the structures of the military industrial complex in a real way. In fact, many of them belong to them. They work, some of these guys who wrote the letter work for the Raytheons of the world, basically. So we have to just be cautious about canonizing, sanctifying, or sanitizing the records of these folks, I think. Nevertheless, the fact that so many of these guys have come out to say something about Trump's ridiculously escalatory response, stealing lines from segregationist mayors in the 60s, I mean, it's, it's, it is awful, I mean, he's a monster. But my fear is that what the glue that holds the generals together is anti-Trumpism right? Not anti-militarism. The second is sort of the veteran community, and that's, that's the groups about face, veterans for peace. Even on the libertarian side, bringourtroopshome.us. Uh, there are organizations that have been organizing for some time now, uh, veterans against the war, but uh, the membership is swelling right now, swelling. And part of the reason, I think, is that they've chosen, 
to be intersectional. They've chosen to be in solidarity. They started that at Standing Rock when About Face and Veterans Peace camped out. And in the process, they've actually like widened their aperture a little bit. And they've especially gotten a lot of membership from uh, women and people of color and the military veterans. I think this is important, but you know, we've stood with Black Lives, we put out this open letter for people to resist and several hundred uh, veterans sign their names in publicly. I mean, you had to put in like data to show that you're really in the military and you put your name to it. And Trump era, that's dangerous. Uh, when Trump gave his speech at West Point, uh, over a thousand now graduates of that academy. This is not a snowflakey lot, folks. I'm the radical in that group, okay? Over a thousand signed a letter just eviscerating uh, Trump's response and basically saying that all his calls were unconstitutional. We have people in the streets. I mean, enormous amount of resistance among the veterans uh, at the protest. And the final group and the most important one and the hardest to measure because this is whitewashed, this is hidden from view, is the rank and file resistance of serving members. We know that reports came into Veterans of Peace and About Face right away. Uh, there are reports in certain units of disciplinary action being taken or considered. People are actually refusing their orders. Um, beyond that though, there's crises of conscience and ethics and competence that are going on. Uh, I'm not the only one, but I can use myself as sort of an anecdotal thing that I can speak to, which is that over the years, I've received these sorts of emails from strangers and former students who are lieutenants now, but mostly strangers saying, what do I do? I'm thinking of being a conscious objector. I'm thinking of, you know, resigning, whatever. Uh, over the years, I would get them occasionally. Since George Floyd's death, uh, I'm now over a hundred strangers who've reached out to me in serious ways. I mean, not just like, hey, let's talk. I, I don't love this. Uh, more like, hey, can you give me the GI rights hotline number? So serious. Uh, more, in other words, in four weeks or five weeks than in three years. So we're seeing this. We don't know exactly how far it's going to go, but I think it's important. And so as I kind of close my remarks, I want to mention the Romero effect. And I think I mentioned on the last webinar, and I talk about it all the time, but, you know, I'm basically agnostic, but I was raised in a, you know, uh, a guilt-based Catholic Irish tradition in working class New York. And, and I still have some of the, that value in me and liberation theology, that core of Catholicism that's, again, also been whitewashed until Pope Francis. Oscar Romero in El Salvador, when a right-wing government full of death squads and its military backed by our CIA and Reagan, uh, when they're killing peasants for political activity, the archbishop, who had been a conservative, decides to speak up. For three years, he gives these very, what would be considered political homilies, but actually they're just in line with, you know, the New Testament, really, or at least the words of the red letters of Jesus. And it is no accident that the last major uh, homily he gives was calling for the troops, ordering them in the name of God, is what he said, to refuse to kill their fellow peasants and to remind them of their solidarity and their oneness with the class that they were killing. It is not an accident that it's basically a week later when he's assassinated on the altar um, in an incredibly sort of Christ-like pose. My point there is that this demonstrates the fear uh, when the foot soldiers revolt. And uh, I wish I had the courage that that rank and file is showing today when I was on active duty. And uh, I'm a little over time, but I hope that helps. And I'm so glad to go into any detail later. Thank you.